33 days. I'm standing on a windy tarmac in Kotzebue, Alaska, a 3,000-person village 20 miles above the Arctic Circle on the Chukchi Sea. In front of me are two airplanes. One will soon dump me deep into the Alaskan Arctic, a place that's generally agreed to be one of the loneliest, most remote, and most hostile on Earth. I'm on edge. This impending voyage into the Arctic is one thing. But I'm also no fan of flying particularly when it's in planes like these single-engine, two- and four-seater bushcraft. Picture empty Campbell's soup cans with wings. Donnie Vincent senses my nerves. He's a backcountry bow hunter and documentary filmmaker on this expedition with me. He sidles up to my shoulder, leans in, and lowers his voice. Most of the pilots up here are whiskey-swilling cowboy mountain men. The type of guys who don't think twice about getting into a bar fight he says over the freezing gusts. But just so you know, I booked the absolute best pilot I could. Brian is top gun. I nod thanks. I'm not telling you we're not going to crash and die, Donnie continues. That is a real risk, okay. But this guy is good. So the odds that we'll be in a plane crash are. My edginess amplifies into existential dread as I cut him off. Okay, I say. Got it. Commercial flying is incredibly safe. The statistics say you're infinitely more likely to die in a crash on the way to the airport than you are in the plane. But this rule does not apply to bush plane flights in Alaska. About 100 of these flights a year end in fire and brimstone, and the FAA recently released an unprecedented warning to Alaskan bush plane pilots after a spike in accidents. This year has been particularly bad. Fierce weather and thick fog and wildfire smoke have been messing with visibility. Donnie tells me that Brian has a colleague named Mike who recently crashed after misreading the weather. Mike was lucky enough to walk away, but the plane had to be rebuilt. Once Brian drops us in the Arctic backcountry, we'll face more dangers. Curious Grizzlies 1,500-pound moose packs of flesh-craving wolves while that wolverines blood-addicted badgers raging glacial rivers violent white toot snowstorms sub-zero temperatures hurricane force winds precipitous cliffs deadly diseases with names like tularemia and hand virus swarming mosquitoes swarming mice swarming rats the runs the barfs the bleats. Dot there might be a million ways to die in the west, but there are two million in the Alaskan backcountry. Our only way out. We'll trudge hundreds of miles across that rugged world until Brian picks us up in 33 days' time. Along the way we'll be searching for a mythical herd of caribou, a migrating army of 400-pound ghosts that silently roam the Arctic tundra, their gnarled four-foot antlers emerging from the crystalline fog only to disappear when the wind shifts. The coming five weeks are an all-in proposition. Unlike, say, hiking the Pacific Crest or the Appalachian Trail, Deep in the Alaskan backcountry you can't decide you're too cold and hungry and wander a couple miles off trail to a highway where you can Uber to the nearest diner for a hot cup of coffee and a stack of flapjacks. There are few, if any, trails. And the closest road, town, point of cell reception, and hospital can be hundreds of miles away. Hell, even death may not be a way out. My insurance policy unfortunately does not offer remotely located corpse recovery coverage. None of this sounds anything like my safe, comfortable life at home. And that's the point. Most people today rarely step outside their comfort zones. We are living progressively sheltered, sterile temperature controlled, overfed, underchallenged, safety netted lives. And it's limiting the degree to which we experience our one wild and precious life, as poet Mary Oliver put it. But a radical new body of evidence shows that people are at their best, physically harder, mentally tougher, and spiritually sounder after experiencing the same discomforts our early ancestors were exposed to every day. Scientists are finding that certain discomforts protect us from physical and psychological problems like obesity, heart disease, cancers, diabetes, depression and anxiety, and even more fundamental issues like feeling a lack of meaning and purpose. There are plenty of, let's say, less committed ways to gain the benefits of discomfort. Stuff a person could easily fold into their daily life to improve their mind, body and spirit. But this trip is at the extreme end of a prescription that researchers across disciplines say we should make a part of our lives. It's part rewilding, part rewiring. And its benefits are all-encompassing. 
Brian Donny, William Altman who is Donny's lifelong cinematographer, and I are outside the Koenig shipping container that acts as REM Aviation's base of operations at Coates Abuse local airport. We're all organizing gear and trying to keep our faces out of the ballistic wind, which is shoveling more salty fog from the sea across the land and into the hazy gray mountains. Let's load up and go before that fog gets worse, says Brian. Donnie used to spend six months at a time in the Alaskan backcountry as a biologist for the Fish and Wildlife Service. He lived out of a yellow north face tent that he describes as a big yellow gumdrop. He's since researched, hunted, and filmed in some of the most extreme and remote locations on Earth. The guy one summer, no kidding, lived among a pack of wolves as he studied salmon on the Tuluksoc River in the Yukon Delta. William has been with Donnie on nearly every hunt and is a rare breed of 20-something who parties like it's 1,899. He spent most of the last decade in an internet and running water-free, 8-foot by 8-foot cabin in the main backwoods. The kid primarily lives on food he hunts, raises, and grows himself. The accompaniment of these guys eases my apprehension. But only sort of. Because the thing about nature is that it's unpredictable and unforgiving. It doesn't care about your experience and what happened the last time you visited it. Nature can always throw rougher stuff at you. Meaner animals, taller cliffs, lower temperatures, wider rivers, and more snow, rain, wind, and sleep. Donnie and William are often reminded of this harrowing reality. They once ran out of food and nearly starved and froze when white tooth storms caused their pickup plane to arrive four days late. Another time they had to shoot a charging locomotive-sized grizzly that would have rearranged their internal organs. By dumb luck the shot ricocheted off the bear's skull, knocking him out cold. I grab my 80-pound backpack, which carries most everything I'll need to survive over the next month. Layers of clothing, food, emergency medical kit, etc. Brian stops me as I'm lugging the bag over to his plane. You and William are in that one, he says, pointing to a freshly painted green and gold four-seater Cessna. We muscle our packs into the plane's hull and I step up into its passenger door and contort myself into its back seat. My knees are jammed up into my throat back here. Donnie and Brian hop into the other plane. It circles the runway and takes off toward the fog as William and I sit waiting in the Cessna. And here comes our pilot. He's young, with a ball cap over a high and tight haircut. Aviator sunglasses. He struts up and slithers into the pilot's seat. Reaches out a gloved hand for a shake. Hi, he says. I'm your pilot, Mike. William peers back at me with a twisted grin. Wait. I think, is this the same Mike that crashed his plane? The propeller kicks, stoking decibels that drown out my inner scream. 35, 55, or 75. I come from a long line of men who seem to run on booze, bullshit, and self-serving chaos. My father who disappeared while I was in the womb once got drunk on St. Patrick's Day, painted his horse green, and rode it into a bar with a woman who was not my mother. An uncle once spent a night in a dry-out cell screaming for reasons unknown to him and everyone in that particular correctional facility on that particular Tuesday night. Your mom fucks Volkswagens. A cousin once came to in the county jail and found that he blacked out into an impromptu family reunion. The police had thrown him into a cell with one of my uncles. Yet another uncle is a frequent drop-in at the Idaho State Prison. And my grandfather was roundly agreed to be the most charming and handsome liar, cheat and drunk in Ada County. Nearly a decade ago, I found myself riding that same family horse. There were a couple of dude, where's my car? Moments, some broken bones and bent relationships, and I was once arrested during an intoxicated attempt to break the land speed record on a collapsible scooter. I was also something of a professional hypocrite. I had an enviable career at a glossy magazine as a health journalist dispensing advice on how to live a better life. I was good at the job. But I wasn't exactly living the wisdom I wrote. Most of my mental energy was spent toggling back and forth between being drunk and obsessing over the next drink. Nearly everything in my life deferred to alcohol. If I wasn't drinking, 
I was running out the clock until the weekend when I drink again. This practice made my life a fast-moving fog, and I lost years in a cycle of weekend binging. I'd march Monday to Friday from hangover to swearing off booze to recovery to convincing myself that this time it would be different to being shit-faced again. Alcohol was my comfort blanket. It killed the stress around my job. It quickly ended boredom. It numbed me to sadness, anxiety, and fear. It covered me from what was uncomfortable, the insecurities, situations, thoughts, and emotions that are just part of being a human. Then, at 28, I awoke one morning soaked in misery and whiskey-tinged vomit. It was the second morning like that in a row, and I'd had plenty like it before. But this time around, I experienced one of those moments I didn't understand at the time, except that I knew something big was happening. I experienced clarity, a state that was at the time about as familiar to me as particle physics. I could see my life as it was and not as I believed it to be. I was a tongue-chewing idiot drunk and career fraud, and everything around me was a damn mess that was only getting messier with each ensuing weekend. I could see that I'd soon be found out and lose my job. Next would be my relationships, because being around me while I was drinking was fun until it wasn't, which usually occurred sometime after the fifth drink. Then would go my possessions. Car, house, etc. Eventually, I'd lose my life. Whether I'd die at 35, 55 or 75, I didn't know. I just knew that my drinking habit was going to end me early. People who say things like let's finish these beers and then ride those at VS aren't exactly models of longevity. Comfort from alcohol was not only numbing me to the life I wanted to live, it was also killing me. I saw a choice. Option 1, do nothing. Cling to complacency and the numbing lifestyle that would ultimately end badly, but allow me to keep drinking. All evidence until then suggested that nothing fixes a problem like the first drink. Or option 2, get uncomfortable. Ditch my liquid comfort blanket. I hadn't a clue where this second route would take me, or if I could even pull it off. And I was terrified. But the funny thing about waking up covered in your own stomach contents is that it makes doing the exact opposite of whatever got you there an easier decision to make. No one gets sober on a Friday evening. It's a Sunday morning coming down kind of a decision. I raised the white flag. This is when the discomfort started. The acute physical hell of drying out lasted for days. There were headaches, nausea, exhaustion, the shakes, the sweats, and other internal hells. My lungs began kicking up what I can only imagine was some kind of a carcinogen cocktail, because I had a habit of chasing drinks with Marlboros. The physical stuff eventually faded below the line of perception. But then the even bigger challenge of sobriety started, dealing with my frenetic thoughts as my booze-altered brain began to rewire itself. My mind was like a hard rubber ball shot from a cannon into a concrete room. It existed in a high-grade state of mania and bounced from joy that I was alive to depression that I got here to terrifying question after terrifying question about my new way of life. How do I not drink? What do I do on weekends? What should I say if I'm at a social event and someone asks me if I want a drink? How will I reconnect with my old friends at college reunions and weddings? It turns out the answers to those questions are, don't drink, anything but drinking, no, thanks, and why don't you cross that bridge when you come to it, but, I understand the simplicity now. But at the time these were profound, baffling questions, like asking a toddler to solve 4x. It comes as no shock to me that half of people admitted to mental health institutions suffer from substance abuse disorders. I required a relearning of life and how to live it. And there were generations of whiskey-bent, hell-bound Easter family chromosomes fighting this new path. These types of genes are coded to make you believe that the solution is a smoky barroom with a jukebox that plays George Jones, and that things will go right this round despite hundreds of examples of evidence to the contrary. But day by day I embraced the raw discomfort of hard change and soon the world opened up. I became aware of the beauty of being alive and better understood my role. Before sobriety for example, all signs seemed to indicate that I was the absolute center of the universe. 
But upon drying out, I realize that I'm just not that damn important in the grand scheme of things. This is a deeply unnerving recognition. But once I started to act on it, admitting that I don't know things and that I could use some help, I gained some peace and perspective. I began connecting with the people I love in new, deeper ways. I started to find silence, experience calm and feel okay with myself. To get out of myself, I got a dog and each morning took him to a nearby river, where I felt a long-forgotten peace and confidence in the 5 a.m. quiet and mist. I became less flustered by everyday problems like work dramas, traffic jams, deadlines and bills. I wasn't a completely new person, and I'd never be confused with Mr. Rogers. But I was more aware, which allowed me to see that I was still surrounded in comfort. I was marinating in the stuff. Except that these were less acutely destructive, but potentially more insidious forms of it. I just had to take a look at my everyday life. I was comfortable, quite literally, every single moment. I awoke in a soft bed in a temperature-controlled home. I commuted to work in a pickup with all the conveniences of a luxury sedan. I killed any semblance of boredom with my smartphone. I sat in an ergonomic desk chair staring at a screen all day working with my mind and not my body. When I arrived home from work, I filled my face with no effort, highly caloric foods that came from Lord knows where. Then I plopped down on my overstuffed sofa to binge on television streamed down from outer space. I rarely, if ever, felt the sensation of discomfort. The most physically uncomfortable thing I did, exercise, was executed inside an air-conditioned building as I watched cable news channels that are increasingly bent on confirming my worldview rather than challenging it. I wouldn't run outside unless the conditions were, well, comfortable. Neither too hot, too cold nor too wet. What could cleansing myself of all these other comforts do for me? 0.004% Humans evolved to seek comfort. We instinctually default to safety shelter warmth, extra food and minimal effort. And that drive through nearly all of human history was beneficial because it pushed us to survive. Discomfort is both physical and emotional. It's hunger, cold, pain, exhaustion, stress, and any other trying sensations and emotions. Our comfort drive led us to find food. To build and take shelter. To flee from predators to avoid overly risky decisions, to do anything and everything that would help us live on and spread our DNA. So it's really no surprise that today, we should still default to that which is most comfortable. Except that our original comforts were negligible and short-lived at best. In an uncomfortable world, consistently seeking a sliver of comfort helped us stay alive. Our common problem today is that our environment has changed but our wiring hasn't. And this wiring is deeply ingrained. About 2.5 million years ago, our ancestor Homo habilis evolved out of the smartest ape-like animals of the time. These men and women walked on two feet and used stone tools, giving them an edge in the wild. But they didn't look much like us, picture a chimp crossed with a modern human, and their brain was about half the size of ours. Then 1.8 million years ago came Homo erectus. This species looked and behaved more like us. They stood about 5 foot 10 and lived in social hunter-gatherer societies. They likely figured out how to use fire and thought abstractly, which we surmise because they created art by engraving designs into objects they found in nature. Sure, this art was more spastic two-year-old than Sistine Chapel, but progress is progress. Next, about 700,000 years ago, came Homo heidelbergensis and then Homo neanderthalensis. Their brains were actually slightly larger than ours and they picked up all the skills from their predecessors, like using tools, creating fire and more. They also learned to build homes, make clothes, and, consequentially, master hunting. They were apex predators. Using stone-tipped spears, they take down animals like red deer, rhinoceroses, and even mammoths. The now extinct, massively trunked mammoth could weigh as much as a Kenworth semi-truck. Despite what insurance advertisements will have us believe, Homo heidelbergensis and Neanderthalensis were not idiots. Their epic hunts required coordinated teamwork. A single man or woman against a mammoth is a massacre for that man or woman. 
but with men and women, a team of them strategizing and working together, we did damage. This is when our ancestors began to understand that putting our heads together to solve common problems could help us not only survive, but also live a little better. Which brings us to us. Our species, called Homo sapiens has been walking this earth for 200,000 to 300,000 years depending on which anthropologist you ask. And we are highly evolved, despite what you may see on reality TV like Cops or any of the Housewives franchises. Early Homo sapiens developed complex tools, languages, cities, currency, farming transportation systems, and much more. And that was before all of the human history we have written down, which is only about 5,000 years worth of time. The modern comforts and conveniences that now most influence our daily experience cars, computers, television, climate control, smartphones, ultra processed food, and more have been used by our species for about 100 years or less. That's around 0.03% of the time we've walked the Earth. Include all the Homos, Habilis, Erectus, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthalensis and us, and open the time scale to 2.5 million years and the figure drops to 0.004%. Constant comfort is a radically new thing for us humans. Over these 2.5 million years, our ancestors' lives were intimately intertwined with discomfort. These people were constantly exposed to the elements. It was either too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, too windy, or too snowy out. The only escape from the weather was a rudimentary shelter, like a cold, damp cave filled with bats and rats, or a hole dug in the ground and roofed with twigs or an animal skin, or some other crude structure that provided enough shelter to keep a person alive, but little else. Today most of us live at 72 degrees, experiencing weather only during the two minutes it takes us to walk across a parking lot, or from the subway station to our offices. Americans now spend about 93% of our time indoors in climate control, and entire cities wouldn't exist had we not developed air conditioning. Like Phoenix and Las Vegas. Early humans were always hungry. The Hadza, a Tanzanian tribe of hunter-gatherers that live similarly to our earliest ancestors, are constantly complaining to anthropologists that they're ravenous. And not the kind of mindless hunger that comes from watching the Food Network. They experience deep, persistent hunger. Early humans surely did not have constant, effortless access to calorie-dense food. They either had to walk miles to find the right place to dig it deep out of the ground, or pick it high off a tree. Or they had to face off with animals both tiny and towering. The Hadza are to this day constantly being stung by swarms of bees when they gather honey, a delicacy for the tribe. Nearly 80% of Neanderthals' bones show signs that their owner had either been maimed or outright killed by animals. Now we can order delivery through an app or drop by a super Walmart and buy anything and everything from honey in a cute plastic bear container to meats packaged in plastic wrap and be rather confident that our errand will not end in grievous bodily harm. When our ancestors weren't searching for food or getting pummeled by mastodons, they had long moments of downtime, lounging around for hours a day. They had to make something out of their boredom. These people allowed their minds to wander and had to get creative and rely on one another for entertainment. As my beautifully blunt then girlfriend, now wife put it when we went camping early in our relationship, we ran out of things to talk about in three hours and had a whole day left. It wasn't until the 1920s when radio was broadcast to the masses that there was a full-time, brainless escape from boredom. Then came big TV in the 1950s. Finally on June 29, 2007 boredom was pronounced dead, thanks to the iPhone. And so our imaginations and deep social connections went with it. When they weren't sitting and doing nothing, our ancestors were working very, very hard. The Hadza exercise 14 times more than the average American. They move fast and hard about 2 hours and 20 minutes a day. Although to be clear, what they're doing is just called life instead of exercise. Early humans would walk or run miles and miles for water and food. In fact, the reason the human body is built the way it is with arched feet, long leg tendons, sweat glands, and more is because we evolved to run down prey. We chase and track the animal for miles and miles until it toppled over from heat exhaustion. Then we'd kill it, butcher it, and carry it all the way back to camp. 
When prey was too heavy to haul, our ancestors would pick up camp and move to the downed food. They faced stress. Lots of it. If they didn't find food, they died. If a lion decided he wanted their food, they died or ran, or got mauled. If they got too far away from water, they died. If violent weather hit, they died. If they got an infection, they died. If they tripped and fractured a leg, they died. And on and on. Sure, modern humans are stressed. More stressed than ever before, according to the American Psychological Association. But we don't suffer from the type of acute stresses humans fretted over for millions of years. Most of us don't experience physical stresses like feeling intense hunger, exhaustion from running down food, carrying heavy loads, or exposing ourselves to freak germs and wild temperature swings. Nor do we suffer from mental stresses like wondering where our next meal is coming from, fearing fanged predators, or dreading that a little nick could get infected and kill us off in a week. The COVID-19 pandemic in fact was likely the first time that many of us felt our forgotten stresses and realized that humans can still be powerless against the natural world. For most modern Americans, stress is so often this traffic is going to make me late to my yoga class stress. Or is my neighbor making more money than me? Stress. Or this spreadsheet is going to take forever. Stress. Or if my child doesn't get into an Ivy League school we will all live lives of complete and utter nothingness stress. It's first world stress. This is why many scholars have written about how the world is, as a whole, improving. They point out that people are living longer and better, are making more money, and are less likely to be murdered or go hungry than at any time before. Even the poorest Americans are well off relative to the grand sweep of generations before them. And yes, many numbers and data and graphs do indeed suggest that the world is better. Of course, the world is better. But there's a catch. Because our ancestors dealt with so much discomfort, there were many things they didn't have to deal with. Namely, the most pressing problems that modern cultures are facing right now. Problems that are making many of our lives unhealthier, unhappier, and less than they could be. Thanks to modern medicine the average person is yes, living longer than ever. But the data shows that the majority of us are living a greater proportion of our years in ill health, propped up by medications and machines. Lifespan might be up, but health span is down. 32% of Americans are overweight and 38% are obese. 8% of the latter classify as extremely obese. That makes a collective 70% of us too heavy. Nearly a third of us now have diabetes or pre-diabetes. More than 40 million Americans have mobility problems that hinder them from getting from point a to be heart disease kills a quarter of us. These are all medical issues that were essentially non-existent until the 20th century. People today are also suffering more and more from diseases of despair, depression, anxiety, addiction, and suicide. Overdose deaths in the last two decades are up more than threefold, and the average American is now more likely to kill themselves than ever before. Evidence suggests that suicide didn't happen throughout nearly all of human history. My high school graduating class of 400, for example, has lost anywhere from one to three people each year to overdoses or suicides since we earned our diplomas. These diseases of despair caused the U.S. life expectancy to fall in 2016, 2017, and 2018. There hasn't been a lifespan drop like this since the period from 1915 to 1918 when World War I and the Spanish flu pandemic united in a symphony of death. So yes, we don't have to deal with discomforts like working for our food, moving hard and heavy each day, feeling deep hunger and being exposed to the elements. But we do have to deal with the side effects of our comfort, long-term physical and mental health problems. We lack physical struggles, like having to work hard for our livelihoods. We have too many ways to numb out like comfort food, cigarettes, alcohol, pills, smartphones, and TV. We're detached from the things that make us feel happy and alive, like connection, being in the natural world, effort, and perseverance. We seem to know something is amiss. One poll found just 6% of Americans believe the world is improving. 
Some anthropologists, in fact, argue that humans were happier in all the time leading up to about 13,000 years ago. People then had simpler needs that were easier to fulfill and were more able to live in the present. Comforts and conveniences are great, but they haven't always moved the ball downfield in our most important metric, happy healthful years. Perhaps existing only in our increasingly overly comfortable, overbuilt environment and always obeying our comfort drives has had unintended consequences and caused us to miss profound human experiences. There are conditions that humans evolved to live in and experiences we were meant to have that are no longer germane to our lives. This has undoubtedly changed us, often not for the best. 800 Faces David Leverai is in his early 30s and a psychologist at Harvard University. He's the picture of an up-and-coming Ivy League doctor of psychology, impeccably spoken, perfectly bearded, and interested in investigating big questions about why humans behave the way we do. Leverai was studying under the famed researcher Dan Gilbert when the two were traveling to a conference. As they stood in line for airport security, they noticed something funny. The TSA agents treat a lot of clearly non-threatening people like existential risks. We've all experienced the phenomenon in real life. Some well-meaning TSA agent rips apart a carry-on seemingly thinking someone's banana is a 9mm Beretta, or a wheelchair-bound 90-year-old who can't walk, or C gets the full body pat down after forgetting she had a half-full bottle of hairspray in her purse. Obviously the phrase better safe than sorry applies here. But we wondered, said Leverai, if all of a sudden people stopped bringing stuff that wasn't allowed into the airport and the luggage scanners never went off would the TSA just relax and do nothing. They didn't think so. Our intuition was that the TSA would do what most of us would do, he said. When they ran out of stuff to find they would start looking for a wider range of stuff, even if this was not conscious or intentional because their job is to look for threats. With that in mind, Leverai recently conducted a series of studies to find out if the human brain searches for problems even when problems become infrequent or don't exist. One of his studies tasked people with viewing a sequence of 800 different human faces that ranged from very intimidating to completely harmless. The people had to judge which of the faces seemed threatening. But once they'd seen the 200th mug Leverai, without the participants' knowledge began showing them fewer and fewer threatening faces. Another of Leverie's studies used a similar setup. Except this time the people were asked to deem whether 240 scientific research proposals were ethical or unethical. About midway through, Leverai began giving the people successively fewer unethical proposals. These two scenarios should be rather black and white, right? A person is either threatening or not. A proposal either does or does not cross a moral line. Because if we can't see these situations as black and white, then it calls into question whether we can really trust our judgment in much bigger issues. Like, it turns out just how comfortable we've become and how that's affecting us. When he looked at all the data, Leverai discovered that humans can't see black or white. We see gray. And the shade of gray we see depends on all of the other shades that came before it. We adjust expectations. As the threatening faces became rare, the study participants began to perceive neutral faces as threatening. When the unethical research proposals became less frequent, people began deeming ambiguous research proposals unethical. He called this prevalence-induced concept change. Essentially problem creep. It explains that as we experience fewer problems, we don't become more satisfied. We just lower our threshold for what we consider a problem. We end up with the same number of troubles. Except our new problems are progressively more hollow. So Leverai got to the heart of why many people can find an issue in nearly any situation, no matter how good we can have it relative to the grand sweep of humanity. We are always moving the goalpost. There is, quite literally, a scientific basis for first-world problems. I think this is a low-level feature of human psychology, Leverai said. The human brain likely evolved to make these relative comparisons because doing so uses far less brain power than remembering every instance of a situation you've seen or been in. 
This brain mechanism in early humans allowed us to make quick decisions and safely navigate our environments. But apply to today's world. As people make all these relative judgments, Leverai said, they become less and less satisfied than they used to be with the same thing. This creep phenomenon applies directly to how we now relate to comforts, said Leverai. Call it comfort creep. When a new comfort is introduced, we adapt to it and our old comforts become unacceptable. Today's comfort is tomorrow's discomfort. This leads to a new level of what's considered comfortable. Stairs were once a new marvel of efficiency. But why take them after the advent of the escalator? A little hard-earned lean meat and some plain potatoes was once the best meal of the year. But why have that bland combo when there are restaurants on every block offering perfectly formulated combinations of sugar, salt, and fat? A chili teepee yurt or simple cabin was once a luxurious respite from the weather. But now we can dial our indoor temperatures to our exact specifications. What's more new comforts have moved the goalpost further away from what we consider an acceptable level of discomfort. Each advancement shrinks our comfort zones. The critical point Leverai told me is that this all occurs unconsciously. We are terrible at noticing that comfort creep is consuming us and what it's doing to us. So what would happen if we could dissolve our surrounding shades of gray and become aware of comfort creep? 20 yards. I first met Donnie in the fall of 2017. I'd been commissioned by a national magazine to write about profound changes in the hunting world. There is a growing group of men and women who are squashing the stereotype of hunters being only doughy bucktooth bubbas. They're the opposite of the hunters who drive to the edge of the civilized world and sit around snacking as they wait for some naive majestic animal to saunter out into a clearing so they can shoot it from afar and add a new decoration to their office wall. That's not the type of hunting our forefathers did. It's not the type of hunting Donnie does either. He's a de facto leader of a small but swelling tribe of backcountry hunters. These people are equal parts hunter ultra endurance athlete locaver, survivalist, and naturalist. Donnie has spent half his life living something like our ancestors. He escapes for months at a time into the world's most beautiful, remote, and harsh landscapes, while carrying on his back everything he needs to survive. A successful hunt means he'll have to pack out the animal in 70 to 100 pound sections across rugged miles to a pickup location. His biggest haul, 14 trips, 100 pounds each of Yukon moose. He utilizes every usable ounce of the animal, providing his family and friends with meat that offers all the whole foods upsells, antibiotic and pesticide free grass fed, and free range to the extreme. First light was meeting the neon of the strip as I left the city limits of Las Vegas and turned onto US 93, a two lane highway that cuts north south across Nevada's Great Basin. I drove four hours through desert where the jackrabbits outnumbered the passing cars and even the AM dial was useless. I wound up in Ely, Nevada, a town whose elevation number is bigger than its population. Donnie jumped out of an F-250 pickup and strode toward me. He was wearing a flannel shirt and oversized boots. His shoulder-length gray hair flowed out from under a Filson watch cap. Picture a bearded frontier Fabio. He reached out a rough hand to shake mine, and went full on Ranger Rick. I've been up there for a week now, and man, it's beautiful. This is fantastic, fantastic country, he said. Then he inhaled the sagey Nevada air and looked toward the 10,000-foot peaks of the White Pine Mountains. Let's head up. Donnie piloted the Ford down an empty highway. He eventually turned onto a bumpy, sagebrush flanked dirt back road. We passed a pulled over pickup surrounded by a group of generously bellied, camouflaged men using binoculars to scope the mountain ranges above. Many guys here stay in a local hotel and hunt from the road, said Donnie, shaking his head. He turned the truck out of the high desert and onto a rocky 4 times 4 road leading into a dark canyon. Donnie began admitting to me that he gets more out of the spiritual, physical process of stalking prey for weeks on end across fantastic places than he does from the kill itself. The process is the reward. But a successful outcome makes the process that much more rewarding. I didn't come from a hunting and fishing family, he said. 
As a kid I got an Outdoor Life book subscription and became obsessed. I wanted those big adventures. During my freshman year of college, I headed up to Prince William Sound for a black bear hunt. We awkwardly bounced up the rough road, leaning into each of the big ruts the truck crawled over. I was obsessed about getting a bear and packing it out, he said. I'd made my way over to this remote beach on Whale Bay when the first bear walked up. I completely forgot what I was there for. I watched how his feet hit the rocks, how he'd pick up salmon and eat it. I noticed all of the super intricate details of his face and eyes and how he breathed. I was blown away. So connected to that bear. I got a really heavy heart and almost started to tear up. The road terminated at a trailhead deep inside the Piney Canyon. We hopped out of the truck's cab, and Donnie began stuffing gear into his pack. No camo. Instead, dark technical outdoor gear you find at Ray instead of Cabela's. Adventure gear like ultralight down mid-layers and Gore-Tex shells designed for mountaineers, he said, fit and perform better. They also make him more approachable to non-hunters. Most big game can only see in grayscale anyways, he said. Big game camo is mostly a marketing ploy. He continued the story. I just couldn't shoot that bear. Later that night the captain of the boat I was staying on told me, I think you're a hunter. I think you'll be disappointed if you don't leave here with a bear said Donnie. We were trudging the steep, pine-flanked trail as the canyon became darker with the falling sun. The next day I went back to the beach. It was surrounded by snow-capped peaks and it was just unbelievably beautiful. There were bald eagles hunting fish. The bay was blood red from a killer whale hunting a humpback whale calf. And then a bear came out of the forest. I aimed and paused, he said as we passed a rocky creek. Then I shot. The bear hit the ground. And then it all hit me really heavy. The bear wasn't going to go on being a bear anymore. And that was on me. But after sitting a while I noticed the eagles and whales again. They were all hunting. There were ravens flying overhead waiting to pick the remains of their kills and my bear. It was like oh okay, I've inserted myself into this ecosystem. I'm just another part of this natural process. He's been part of the process ever since. After college Donnie signed on to be a field biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He'd spend six months at a time surveying salmon counts on Alaska's Tuluksoc River. I was alone up there. I lived out of a three-man yellow tent, he said. I'd see another human every three weeks, when my supervisor would come to drop off supplies. I'd fish for my dinner alongside a pack of wolves. He eventually began filming his adventures. Partly to add evidence to his Jack London escape stories, and partly to show people what they're missing. He first shot with a cheap handheld camera. Then he met William, who'd been filming his own hunts in the Northeast. They created a hunting documentary which they call The River's Divide. It's nothing like the stuff you might see on the Outdoors channel. So many hunting films and shows celebrate death. whack -em and stack -em, they say. It's gross, just gross, said Donnie. His films are more like planet Earth, but with hunting. Long, quiet shots of, say, a misty fall morning at a pond or extended footage of a fox who wandered into camp. The River's Divide covers Donnie's four-year odyssey searching for a Badlands whitetail he named Steve. It focuses on the buck's habitat evolution and personality, along with the conflicted emotions Donnie felt after the kill. I got thousands of letters from hunters and non-hunters alike after that. People liked my approach. They also connected with the movies, I think, because they show the value of breaking out of the modern rat race and being present in and a part of nature. Donnie now spends months each year out of the rat race, exploring hundreds of miles of untamed, remote regions of the Arctic, Mexico, Russia, Alaska, the Yukon and more. If you want to have amazing experiences, he said as we wove up the trail, the silhouette of towering pines black against the moonlit navy sky, you have to put yourself in amazing places. The guy is a far-out mix of Davy Crockett, David Attenborough, and the Dalai Lama. When we arrived at our first camping spot, it was a kind of dark I'd never encounter in Las Vegas.
A patch of rocky ground was the only semi-flat space we could find in a pitchy mountain meadow. I filled my water bottle at a spring seeping from the hillside and took a long drink. I was shaking. It was nearly freezing outside. Apparently my 72-degree lifestyle, going from temperature-controlled home to car to office to home, hadn't exactly readied my brain and body for any type of weather that was not. 72 degrees. I was feeling the kind of cold that travels up your extremities and into the center of your core. So I put on every single layer I'd packed. A wool t-shirt, a wool midweight layer, a down vest, a jacket, hat, and gloves. I still shivered like a fool. William stood stoically near the spring wearing a short sleeve t-shirt, stone dead to the temperature. Aren't you cold? I asked. Huh? He said, apparently unaware of the frost exiting his mouth in the reply. Cold, I said, pulling on the sleeve of my jacket. Aren't you cold? Oh no. Not really. I get that it's cold out, said William. But it doesn't bother me. I kind of like how it feels. I can usually wear a t-shirt down to 40 degrees. We all convened to eat dinner in Donnie's four-man teepee, which sounds weird, but it's basically just a tent with a higher roof and no floor cover. I wasn't anti-anting, but I also wasn't ready to pick up a gun or bow. So I asked Donnie, why hunt at all? Trophy hunting to me seems abhorrent. Meat is readily available in every restaurant and grocery store. He agreed with me about trophy hunting. Then he explained to me the strict ethical code that he developed during his work as a wildlife biology researcher. For example, he only hunts older members of a species because removing an old animal often improves the health of the herd as a whole while taking a young animal does the opposite. It also allows youngsters to live out a full life. He adds that he's sometimes, much to his annoyance, confused with a trophy hunter. I'm definitely not chasing antlers or horns, he said. But older animals often have the largest antlers and horns. Donnie sat back onto his sleeping pad to get philosophical. We came up through an ecosystem of predator and prey. If you asked a rabbit, why are you a rabbit? He'd probably say, I don't know. I'm just a rabbit. I eat carrots and I have this poofy tail and floppy ears. I've always been a rabbit. So that's kind of my answer to, Donnie said. I'm a hunter. When you peel back all the layers, I think humans basically evolved from single-celled organisms into apes, into humans. We are animals. And we are fundamentally hunting and gathering animals. Most of us still partake in some level of predator-prey relationship. Hunting and gathering. Because most of us still eat meat, and all of us still eat vegetables, he said. But we now have the luxury of having all of our hunting and gathering done for us at an industrial scale. If we didn't have that, I guarantee we'd all still be doing our own hunting and gathering. I think I'm just closer to our original form compared to most people. Then he paused for a time. Look, I know hunting is controversial, he said. But if you eat meat, your barrier to entry is likely going into the grocery and swiping a credit card. You don't know anything about the animal, how it lived, where it came from, or what kind of life it had. Well, I know. We talked a lot about meat during dinner. But there wasn't much to the actual meal. Just some reconstituted backpacking mush. Afterward I retreated to my modest quarters, a tarp propped up by a trekking pole, and tried to get some sleep. The trip would only get more uncomfortable from there. Over the next few days we would climb steep, untamed hills for hours on end with 60-pound packs on our backs. Getting water in the high country required descending thousands of feet to a spring below and then toting the heavy, awkward water bags back up to camp. When we weren't hiking, we were sitting atop windswept peaks, using a spotting scope to look for elk. Except we had just one spotting scope, and I had no clue where to look. So I sat in a state of boredom I hadn't experienced since I was a junior high student waiting for algebra class to end. To keep our packs lighter we subsisted on a Snickers bar or two and a freeze-dried meal each day. That's enough food for an Instagram model maybe.
but it surely wasn't enough for a grown man who'd spent all day huffing a heavy pack uphill. I was ravenous. I also didn't shower or wash my hands the entire time in oddity in the age of Purell. Nor did I remove my layers, gloves, or hat. I spent a lot of time questioning the necessity of the whole endeavor. But after a few days of hiking the 10,000-foot granite and limestone ridges among Bristlecone's 2,000-year-old pines that exist only in the West's harshest, highest landscapes, we experienced a close encounter. Get down, Donnie Whisper shouted. A pickup truck-sized bull elk stood 60 yards ahead. His rear end faced us as he bowed down his neck to eat grass, his antlers sweeping the dry mountain air like construction cranes. We hit the dirt. If the elk smelled us, he'd break into a 40 mile an hour gallop, out of sight and range. Donnie knocked an arrow in his bow and began an exaggerated cartoonish tiptoe toward the elk. At 20 yards out, we crouched behind a granite boulder and waited. We were looking for the animal to show us his shoulder. The arrow would hopefully silently and cleanly enter there, slicing its way across the dorsal aorta and into the lung. A couple of seconds of life, at most, after a shot like that. Arrows are silent and sharp. The animal often topples over before becoming aware of its deathly predicament. The bull stopped chewing. His dark eyes seemed to squint as his white and brown ears drew back. He lifted his head and turned to inspect his surroundings. This exposed his vital area. Donnie pulled his bow to full draw. Zen monks meditate for decades to achieve the state of presence I discovered. My senses converged on that elk and my relation to it. I was aware of the thick texture of its fur and the way it elegantly transitioned from tan to brown to white. I noticed the knobs, shallow curves, and sharp points of its overbuilt antlers. I heard its teeth masticating the grass, his heavy breaths picking up and swelling his ribcage. I had never been so close to death, the moment where the life cycle ends for one living thing so that it may continue for another. The last meat I'd eaten came in a paper bag and between a bun, and was likely shipped from some secretive Midwestern slaughterhouse. I wondered only if Donnie was going to let that arrow fly 200 miles an hour into that unassuming bull. Until I became aware of a spectator. A coyote lurked behind us, anticipating a dinner of elk entrails. The elk became aware too, and he spooked, galloping off as Donnie muscled the bowstring back to a rest. He was big and beautiful, but he was too young, Donnie said. Smoke from western wildfires was filtering the sun a maroon shade as we walked the ridges back to camp. I felt more alive than I had since my early days of sobriety, when I realized I had a whole new life ahead of me. My mind was quieter my body abler. I felt more in tune with higher rhythms than with the frenetic frequencies of modern life. 50 50ths. When I returned to civilization, the discomfort induced buzz hung around for weeks. I kept returning in my head to how I felt during those wild days, ascending unforgiving mountain faces, missing meals attempting in vain to escape the cold never knowing what the untamed world would throw at me next. It was feeling the opposite of comfort creep. It was, I'd soon learned from a Harvard-educated doctor, a type of misogi. The Kojiki is a Japanese document commissioned by Empress Genne in the year at 711. It's the oldest living document in Japan. It includes myths, legends, and historical accounts of the Japanese archipelago, the formation of heaven and earth, and the origins of Shinto gods and heroes. The Kojiki's most epic tale spawned Misogi. Izanagi was a god in the Shinto faith, and was married to the Shinto goddess of creation and death. Things were perfect for the two gods, until Izanagi's wife died in childbirth. She descended into the land of the dead, the underworld where all Shinto gods go in the afterlife. The Shinto god was wrecked. He wept and slumbered through life, until he decided he just couldn't live that way anymore. He made up his mind to venture into the land of the dead to bring back his wife. Izanagi entered a cavern that led into the underworld. As he journeyed deeper he encountered a hellish landscape. There were demons, zombies, and grotesque figures who wanted to capture him and keep him there for eternity. Despite all of hell working to stop him, Izanagi pushed on and found his wife. 
but he was terrified to see that she'd succumbed to hell's perils. She was partially decomposed and demonic looking. He realized he'd be next to fall to the underworld's defilements if he didn't escape quickly. So Izanagi made a fantastic break through the caverns of hell. Demons and monsters grabbed at him, trying to pull him downward. Failure seemed imminent. He nearly gave up. But he dug deep mentally and physically, kept pushing, and eventually burst from the cavern's entrance. Izanagi then dove into a nearby freezing river to purify himself from the degradations of hell. The experience rocketed him into a state of sumikuri, pure clarity of mind and body, and removed all his impurities' weaknesses and past limits. It made him tougher in mind, body and spirit. The state of sumikuri provided by Misogi is why ancient students of Aikido would immerse themselves in natural bodies of cold water. Waterfalls, streams, or the ocean would wash away their defilements and reconnect them with the universe. More recently, the idea of misogi has been applied to other forms of using epic challenges in nature to cleanse the defilements of the modern world. These modern massages offer a hard brain, body, and spirit reboot. They help their practitioners smash previous limits and deliver the mindful, centering confidence and competence the Japanese Aikido followers were also seeking. Dr. Marcus Elliott pioneered this new brand of misogi. And he's convinced it works. When I contacted Elliott about misogi he first let me know that he was tired of talking numbers and figures about NBA players and the biomechanics of twisted ankles, compressive loads of a vertical jump, and eccentric forces applied during the step-back three-pointer. I assumed you were reaching out about athlete data and modeling. Which I love, said Elliot, a Harvard-trained physician who owns P3, a sports science facility that uses deep biometric data to improve pro-athlete performance. But I don't really want to talk about that. The Wall Street Journal had just visited Elliot's Santa Barbara-based facility, an unmarked warehouse gym filled with fitness equipment, computers, and scientific gizmos. The newspaper was profiling Elliot and his work with Luka Doncic, the 2000, 18 NBA Rookie of the Year, All-Star, etc. At just 15 years old, Doncic began traveling the 6,000 miles from his home in Slovenia to P3. There Elliot discovered the secret sauce of Luka's game. Elliot and his team of PhDs attached reflective markers all over the kid, his torso back, legs, knees, ankles, feet and more. Then Doncic went through all the motions he might use in a game. Meanwhile, a movie set's worth of 3D cameras rolled and captured more than 5,000 data points. With that information, Elliot could see the movement of sign trees that might be setting Doncic up for injury, and what physical skills he was good and bad at. The data showed Doncic couldn't jump to save his life. But he was incredibly gifted at applying eccentric force. This basically means that Luca is fast at slowing down. Elliot's advice, Luca should develop his game around plays where he sprints forward, stops abruptly, and shoots, leaving his defender still careening forward as the shot arcs toward the hoop. Luca did just that. Now the kid's the future of the NBA. Roughly 60% of NBA players have come through P3 to uncover the perils and opportunities hidden within their movement patterns. Fascinating stuff. But it's not what I wanted to talk about either. I had Misogi on my mind, and that's what Elliot wanted to hear. If we can really dig into Misogi, he said, I'm game to having you come down. And so it was a handful of months later that I found myself hammering up a cliffside trail above Santa Barbara with Elliot. We powered through creeks and over boulders. We would zoomed through rock gardens and abundantly green forests that smelled like fresh eucalyptus. After we bounded up a punishingly steep section with a view of the ocean, we both doubled over hands to knees to suck air. Over our species hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, Elliot said, it was essential for our survival to do hard shit all the time. To be challenged. And this was without safety nets. These challenges could be from hunts, getting resources for the tribe moving from summering to wintering grounds, and so on. Each time we took on one of these challenges, we'd learn what our potential is. Elliot is six foot one with a trim, 190 pound build of a triathlete. Picture a younger Tanner, Sokol cross between Dennis Quaid and Bruce Springsteen. He's 54, 
but I would have believed him had he told me he was 40. In modern society, however, Elliot said, it's suddenly possible to survive without being challenged. You'll still have plenty of food. You'll have a comfortable home. A good job to show up to, and some people who love you. And that seems like an okay life, right? But, he said, sweeping his arm to create a big imaginary circle that encompassed the trail and foliage flanking it. Let's say your potential is this big circle. Then he pulled his hands into his chest and made a dinner plate sized circle in the exact middle of the much larger circle. Well, most of us live in this small space right here. We have no idea what exists on the edges of our potential. And by not having any idea of what it's like out on the edge. Man, we really miss something vital. A salty wind was blowing over the ocean and sidling up into the hills. It passed over my sweat-soaked t-shirt as Elliot continued. I believe people have innate evolutionary machinery that gets triggered when they go out and do really fucking hard things. When they explore those edges of their comfort zone. Enter Misogi, a circumnavigation of the edges of human potential. Each year for the last quarter century Elliot has undertaken one of these epic, far-out challenges. Think of it this way, he said. In the gym, I identify a problem an athlete has that is putting him or her at risk. Then I use the artificial construct of the gym environment to improve that athlete's performance when he or she goes into the unpredictable, unstructured wild west of a game. A hiker with a black lab passed us on her way down. Elliot and I both patted the dog. Misogis are that same concept. Except for the modern condition. In Misogi we're using the artificial, contrived concept of going out and doing a hard task to mimic these challenges that humans use to face all the time. These challenges that our environment used to naturally show us that we're so removed from now, he said. Then when we return to the wild west of our everyday lives we are better for it. We have the right tools for the job. The practice has cranked the dial of his physical mental and spiritual health and potential, he said. And done the same for the other seekers who've joined him. There is for example Nelson Parrish, a 40-something Santa Barbara artist whose work melds painting, sculpted metals, and natural woods. The work is contextualized through the verbiage of speed and language of color Parrish told me. Its goal is to force the viewer to disengage from the peripheral, and force a consideration of the expansion and contraction of time. The work's been featured in Vogue magazine and is collected by the Hermes family, Rob Lowe, John Legend, and more. Misogi is not about physical accomplishment, said Parrish. It asks, what are you mentally and spiritually willing to put yourself through to be a better human? Misogis have allowed me to let go of fear and anxiousness, and you can see that in my work. There is also Kyle Korver, the NBA All-Star and jump shot artist who is fourth on the all-time three-pointer list. Korver credits his most clutch performances to the lessons of Misogi. One year we carried an 85-pound rock five kilometers underwater, said Elliot, speaking of a Misogi parish and Korver participated in. That Misogi occurred just a few miles downhill from this trail, along the coast of Santa Barbara Island. One guy would dive anywhere from 7 to 10 feet down. He'd pick up the rock and cradle it, then walk the ocean floor as far as he could, maybe 10 to 20 yards. Then another guy would dive down and do the same. And so on and so forth until after 5 hours the rock was at point B. Another year we stand up paddleboarded 25 miles across the Santa Barbara Channel, said Elliot. We'd only paddleboarded a few times before that. Waves kept knocking us into the ocean every 10 minutes. We couldn't think about crossing the full channel. Instead we had to focus on the process in front of us. Keeping our balance and getting in one perfect stroke. Then one more perfect stroke. And eventually we looked up and were across an ocean. Corver said the paddleboard Misogi led him to break the NBA record for the most consecutive games with a three-pointer. As he inched toward the record, his teammates would remind him that he had only, say 12 more games with a three-pointer to go. He'd tell them that all he cared about was the next perfect stroke. Misogi may uncover the coveted flow state. As a young psychology researcher in the 1960s, 
Mahali C6 and Mali noticed something fascinating about artists. They could become completely present and engrossed in their work. In these instances their action and awareness would merge. Random thoughts, bodily sensations like pain or hunger, and even their sense of ego and self would all fade. It was a sort of prolonged zen in the art of art. So he began studying the state, which he eventually named flow state. Over C6 and Malai's career where he ran the psychology department at the University of Chicago and was president of the American Psychology Association, he interviewed thousands of high-level performers. They ranged from chess players, rock climbers, and painters to surgeons, writers, and Formula One drivers. Lapsing into flow requires two conditions, the task must stretch a person's limits, and it must have a clear goal. The flow state, C6 and Mali and the other researchers now believe is a key driver of happiness and growth. It is the opposite of apathy. C6 and Mali wrote that flow has the potential to make life more rich, intense and meaningful, it is good because it increases the strengths and complexity of the self. Elliot grew up playing any sport he could, football, baseball, etc. and developed an early obsession with physiology and human performance. The interest ran so deep that in his teens he asked his parents for a subscription to the academic journal Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise for Christmas. Elliot planned to play college ball but injured himself in high school. He jumped around universities. Transferred from UC Berkeley to UC Santa Barbara to Harvard. After I recovered from the injury, I still needed some way to physically challenge myself. So I got into endurance sports, he said. In college I didn't ever party. All I did was train and study like a madman. I lived out of a VW van for a few years. It all was very simple. I had just a few belongings. If I ended the day fitter or smarter then it was a good day. Elliot won some big races, landed a sponsorship with Nike, and made the top 10 in world triathlete rankings. He applied to Harvard Medical School and an MIT PhD program in biomechanics, the study of biological systems through mechanical principles. Both schools offered him a spot. I had no desire to be a doctor. But I ended up going to medical school because I thought it would be more interesting, he said. One moment, I'd be cutting someone open and the next dealing with a psych patient. He quit triathlons in medical school. When I started racing I'd already decided I was going to quit when I was 25, he said. Needing to spend 100 hours a week in class on rounds, and studying didn't help, either. But all of that silent, solitary time running writing or swimming, becoming comfortable with discomfort, persisting despite all of his biological impulses telling him to slow down or tap out, had remodeled his psyche. Endurance sports gave me some understanding of what it was to push to deeper levels, and find new layers within myself, he told me. When I stopped doing triathlons, I still had this sense of adventure. This need to explore those edges where I'd find a new, better part of myself. So Elliot began doing what he initially called these cookie challenges. Once or twice a year he'd take on an unstructured difficult task. For instance, after finishing rounds I drove all night to New Hampshire's White Mountains, sleep deprived and running on hospital food and decided to hike to the top of the forest peak in one day, with no preparation, he said. It was all just to see if I could. I'd get to what I thought was my edge, but I'd keep going. Then eventually I'd realize I was way past my old edge and still going. And so that edge was now in a different place than when I started. And that was so satisfying, so satisfying. One year Elliot and a med school friend, Garth Meckler flew into Riverton, Wyoming for one of the cookie adventures. We hitched a ride on a post office truck from the airport out to a trailhead. And then we powered out a 15-hour day into the wilderness with 80-pound packs on our back. We were just kicking each other's asses, Elliot said. Garth was an Olympic-level judo competitor. And as we were hiking he told me about this thing that his judo dojo borrowed from the samurai who borrowed it from Aikido, who borrowed it from these ancient Japanese religious texts. And it was called a misogi challenge. So I started calling these cookie challenges misogi as a tip of the hat to Garth and as a recognition that trying really hard shit is purifying and life enhancing. 
Elliot graduated from medical school $330,000 in debt. My instructors at Harvard wanted me to be an academic. But I just wasn't built to be caged in a lab hospital or office. I wanted to be on the ground and really affect things, he said. Team athletic training at the time hadn't evolved much past tweaking sets and reps. It was really clear in my mind that there was going to be value in applying more science to sport, and that if I didn't try it I'd always regret it, said Elliot. But I needed a real problem to solve. The New England Patriots had a problem. They were at the time a mediocre football team racked with an average of 21.5 hamstring injuries a year. Elliot took a scientist's approach to the issue. He studied years of player data on the injury's common origins and tested the team. Then he took a physician's approach to the solution. He developed individualized player training prescriptions that he believed would reduce the chance of the injury, even though he'd been told by his instructors that exercise medicine was a waste of a world-class education. His work dropped the Patriots' hamstring injury rate to just three a season. Won a couple Super Bowls with the team, said Elliott. Next he became the MLB's first director of sports science and performance. And now he's doing this basketball thing. P3 opened in 2006. Elliot is considered a pioneer and one of the world's foremost sports scientists. His brand is officially partnered with the NBA and his client list is a who's who of the game, James Harden, Cotty Leonard, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Doncic, and many more. He's also continued working with individual pros in sports across the board and is beginning to consult for world soccer and NASCAR. Recently, Harvard Medical School awarded Elliott with one of its highest honors, the Augustus Thorndike Visiting Lecturer Award. It's funny that the same people who were telling me, I was wasting my time said come back and teach us said Elliott. The massages have continued one a year, and Elliot credits them with his ability to affect things in his personal and professional life. Massages can show you that you had this latent potential you didn't realize and that you can go further than you ever believed. When you put yourself in a challenging environment where you have a good chance of failing, lots of fears fade, and things start moving. Elliot stepped forward to give me a pound, then turned and bounded down the trail, his chiseled legs a pair of pistons kicking up dust. We eventually ascended into a shady forest where the trail flattened. In our model of Misogi, there are only two rules, said Elliot. Rule number one is that it has to be really fucking hard. Rule number two is that you can't die. I understood the not dying part, but asked him how he determines if something is hard enough. We're generally guided by the idea that you should have a 50% chance of success if you do everything right, he said. So if you decided you wanted to run a 25-mile trail, and you're preparing by working up to a 20-mile training run and doing 35 or 40 miles a week of running, that's not a misogi. Your chance of failure is too low. But if you've never run more than 10 miles, think you could probably run 15 but are iffy on whether you could run 20. Then that 25 miles is probably a misogi. This rule also renders misogi a moving target. One person's 50% is often not the same as another's. If someone has never run more than a couple miles, then a 10k could be a misogi, said Elliot. Modern humans may have an unmet need to do what's truly difficult for us. New research shows that depression, anxiety, and feeling like you don't belong can be linked to being untested. So you must fail about half the time. I asked. I've actually failed my last couple massages, he said. Elliot's most recent was a rim-to-rim-to-rim -rim -rim run of the Grand Canyon. A 46-mile physical moonshot with roughly 22,000 feet of elevation change. I hadn't run for years, he said. But I put in a couple of 18-mile runs beforehand. He failed. Hard. I really blew up my knees on the descent off the south rim, he said. Once we made it up to the north rim we began descending back down to the canyon floor. I realized I wasn't going to make it. If I continued I'd probably have to be helicoptered out of there. So I hiked back up to the north rim and managed to chase down the last four-hour shuttle back to the south rim, where I parked. 
The forest opened into a steep section. And I can tell you, he said through heavy breaths as we powered up a hill, the human brain hates this construct. The brain wants nothing to do with failure. Especially if you execute perfectly on your side. It's a hardwired phenomenon. Scientists at the University of Michigan investigated the evolutionary origins of fear. They say our current fears are often driven by our past lifestyles. Early humans used to regularly face potentially lethal danger from hungry predators and venomous snakes, members of other tribes' violent weather and treacherous landscapes, loss of social status, and so on. This is why humans today can still easily spot rustling in bushes or snakes slithering through the grass. Why we're wary of strangers. Why we avoid bad weather and heights. Why we become anxious when we have to stick our necks out in public, like with public speaking. Failure even a hundred years ago could mean that you die, said Elliot. But people vastly overestimate the consequences of failure today. Failure now is that you fuck up a PowerPoint presentation, and your boss gives you a bad look. The human mind is programmed to overestimate the consequences of something like screwing up a PowerPoint, because past social failures often got us kicked out of the tribe, after which we usually die at the hands of nature, according to those Michigan scientists. So this evolutionary machinery we have doesn't serve us anymore, Elliot said. Because I can tell you that nothing great in life comes with complete assurance of success. Engaging in an environment where there's a high probability of failure, even if you execute perfectly, has huge ramifications for helping you lose a fear of failing. Huge ramifications for showing you what your potential is. Looking back on the rim to rim to rim run. He said through exasperated breaths, I hadn't even run 20 miles. My chance of making it wasn't even close to 50%. Not even close. It was so far from 50. It was probably 10 or 15. But standing on the edge of the south rim of the Grand Canyon at the beginning. Even if I didn't feel superhuman, I felt like I had the right tools to go explore this thing. Powers beyond what was obvious to me. There's adventure in that. Variations of the Misogi myth exist through time and space. Greek, Mesopotamian, Buddhist Norse, Christian, Hindu and ancient Egyptian mythology all have some version of what Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey. The hero exits the comfort of home for adventure. He's hit with a challenge. It tests his physical, psychological and spiritual fortitude. He struggles. Yet he manages to prevail. He returns with heightened knowledge skills confidence, and experience, and a clearer sense of his or her place in the world. And research going back to the late 1800s proves that mere mortals benefit from epic physical trials. Arnold Van Gennep born in 1873 was brilliant, but always a proper pain in the ass. His teachers in his French elementary school reported that Van Gennep was smart, but a terrible boy, so his parents dumped him into boarding school. There he kept up his reputation. The kid was a valedictorian who had a standing meeting in the principal's office. Then Jeanette's stepfather, a surgeon, wanted him to follow in the old man's footsteps and study surgery in Lyon. Then Jeanette decided he'd rather study the topic in Paris. The stepfather wouldn't concede. So Van Jeanette decided he'd irk the old man a step further. He wouldn't go into medicine at all. Instead he'd study languages and anthropology. Van Genep could, by his own admission, speak 18 languages and a fair amount of dialects. That talent sparked in him an interest in other cultures. After college Van Genep began translating anthropological studies. Thanks to colonialism, studies were rushing in from many different countries, all in different languages. Van Genep became a terminal for this new research. He translated field work about people who lived around the world, in places ranging from the plains of Mongolia and North America to the islands of Fiji and Greece. He quickly discovered a unique commonality among these far-off bands of humans. Men and women in these cultures undertook a physical nature-based rite of passage. For example, the young men of the Aboriginal people, Australian natives who have lived on the island continent for some 65,000 years, went on walkabout. They'd venture alone for up to six months into the Australian outback, 
a place that's essentially uninhabitable. Its temperatures can reach above 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. Its venomous snakes are among the deadliest in the world. The person was toast if he hadn't prepared for the quest by practicing skills like building a shelter, hunting and foraging for food, learning which plants act as medicine, and anything else that he might need in order not to die. Or he'd come back into camp a failure if he came back at all. But if the person made it, he'd return to the tribe physically and mentally tougher and more capable, with a greater understanding of the world and his place in it. The Inuit have a similar tradition. It's not quite as long or lonely, but it's a lot colder. When Inuit children appear strong enough, usually around age 12, elders lead them out into the Arctic for their first hunt. They bring tents, spears, and other necessities, and eat what they kill. The journey takes place across miles and weeks, and the young person must down a narwhal, caribou, or bearded seal. The kids pick up valuable survival skills and evolve as people. The journey also hammers them with the harsh weather of the Arctic. This toughens them while also teaching them skills they need to thrive. Then there's the rite of passage of the Maasai tribe who lives in Kenya and Tanzania. Young Maasai men were sent alone into the savanna to hunt a male lion. Not with a rifle or a bow. With a spear. These solo lion hunts required an unbelievable amount of training. A person needed strength endurance, undaunted courage, and hunting skills that he'd literally bet his life on. These men didn't sneak up on a sleeping lion. They chase it while rattling bells at it, to compel the lion to square off with the skinny hunters face to face. If the Maasai man succeeded, he'd have completed the ultimate physical and mental challenge, and officially transitioned into a warrior. Or he failed, and officially transitioned into dinner for a pride of lions. As the Maasai Association, a group that preserves and celebrates Maasai heritage, casually notes, many warriors have been lost to lions. The Nez Perce, Native Americans who live in the Pacific Northwest, went on vision quests. They'd walk into the mountains or desert unarmed and without food to spend about a week in solitude. They'd fast and drink little water, expose themselves to the elements, and go without shelter or fire. Yellow Wolf, a Nez Perce warrior who fought in the Nez Perce War of 1877, explained that the process developed strength to help you in dangers in battle. These types of mind, body, and spirit strengthening vision quests were common among many indigenous American tribes. The idea of a rite of passage is that the elders are seeing in you the potential to rise up and achieve this really important, challenging thing that is going to benefit you and everyone around you on many levels, said Elliot. They're saying, we think you're ready, but you're really going to have to dig deep and find your shit. In 1909 Van Genep wrote a seminal text about these events, which he called the Rites of Passage. He's the person who coined the term. He found that these processes, whether walking around the outback, hunting a lion in Kenya, tripping out on the Columbia River Plateau, or perhaps even undergoing a misogi, all have three key elements. The first is separation. The person exits the society in which they live and ventures into the wild. The second is transition. The person enters a challenging middle ground where they battle with nature and their mind telling them to quit. The third is incorporation. The person completes the challenge and re-enters their normal life an improved person. It's an exploration and expansion of the edge of a person's comfort zone. Misogi Elliott said is the same. Massages are an emotional, spiritual, and psychological challenge that masquerades as a physical challenge. As we run, Elliot and I talk about how rites of passage, in the traditional sense, are largely gone. What do we have now? He asked. Rites of passage still exist in a few cultures. The Dutch continue to uphold a scouting tradition called dropping. It involves blindfolding kids and then dropping them in the woods at night with limited resources to see if they can find their way home. But I don't know anyone whose parents dumped them in the wilderness and said, see you in six months, or handed them a crude weapon and said, bring me the corpse of the most deadly animal you can find. Society has in fact, taken an extremely opposite approach. Scientists at New York University identify 1,000. 990 as the beginning of helicopter parenting. 
The researchers say that's when many parents stopped allowing their children to go outside unsupervised until they were as old as 16 due to unfounded, media-driven fears of kidnapping. We've now deteriorated from helicopter parenting to snowplow parenting. These parents violently force any and all obstacles out of their child's path. Preventing kids from exploring their edges is largely thought to be the cause of the abnormally high and growing rates of anxiety and depression in young people. A study found that anxiety and depression rates in college students rose roughly 80% in the generation just after helicopter parenting began. Some states have even had to pass free-range parenting laws after some parents were being charged with neglect for letting their kids go outside alone. I'm old enough that I spent the majority of my youth outside alone or with friends. But as Elliot and I run, I try to think of my own rite of passage. I did attain the Eagle Scout ranking. But even scouting's most challenging outdoor adventures were no fail propositions. My troop's closest thing to the Dutch practice of dropping was the Wilderness Survival Merit Badge exercise. But the test was constantly being cancelled due to bad weather, ironically. Anthony Stevens, a Jungian psychologist, has spent a career studying archetypes and rites of passage. He believes these rites are fundamental to the human experience, a sort of crossing of a line in the sand that makes humans human. Although our culture has allowed rites of passage to atrophy with disuse, he wrote there persists in all of us an archetypal need to be initiated. It was 7.35 p.m. and Elliot and I were at his home in the Santa Barbara Hills. After our run we hung around the P3 facility. Then we cruised up to his house and had just finished dinner, a lasagna prepared by his wife Nadine. She was born in a small village in Bavaria and moved across the United States racking up degree after degree until she met Elliot. She's tall and blonde, and the opposite of a helicopter parent. Nadine encourages her kids to surf and go on mini massages with her husband, but she also enforces misogi rule number two, don't die. We all have families, said Elliot. So the worst case of misogi is that you fail. And maybe you had a long day and it might leave a few scars. But you can't die. And that rule is pretty simple. How do you? I searched for the right words to use in front of Nadine. Make sure you don't break rule number two. During a misogi you definitely don't feel like you're in control, said Elliot but you won't die. You do have to ensure you'll be safe. We had a safety dive team present in the underwater rock Misogi. In the channel crossing we had a safety boat. Toward the end of the evening, Elliot mentioned to me that he has a couple of softer rules for massages. He described them as guidelines more than hard rules. One was that the Misogi should be quirky, creative, far out, something uncommon. Moving an 85-pound rock 5 kilometers underwater. I asked. He smiled. Yes. And the reason for this is because the more quirky the misogi, the less chance you can compare it to anything else, he said. It's important to take on challenges that are your challenges. Misogi is you against you. It's against this phenomenon of oh, that guy did this thing in this amount of time, and I'm going to try to do it faster. Because that's comparison shopping. And that's just such a shitty way to go through life. Parrish talked at length about this guideline. He summed it up like this, when you remove superficial metrics, you can accomplish way more. Which brought Elliot to guideline 2, don't advertise misogi. It's okay to talk about misogi with friends and family. But you don't tweet, Instagram, Facebook, or boast about misogi. Everyone today has such outward-facing lives, said Elliot. They do stuff so they can post on social media about some badass thing they did to get a bunch of likes. Massages are inward-facing, he said. A big part of the value proposition is that I'm going to do something that's really uncomfortable. I'm going to want to quit. And it's going to be hard not to quit because no one is watching. But I'm not going to quit because I'm watching. And then I can reflect back on how I was the only person watching myself, and I still rose to the occasion in a big way. There's some deep satisfaction in that. Did you really do what you think is the right thing when you were the only person watching?
Or do you need an audience or a big pat on the back for that? Are you not important enough to do it for you? We had this guideline before social media, and it seems more relevant today. Elliot is an impressive character, with the Harvard MD and history of improving human performance. But his thrill-seeking cookie challenges can sometimes come across as something less than scholarly. After I came out of his charismatic spell, I sought out another scientist to learn if there's any science to massages. Mark Siri, PhD has spent his life studying the edge of the human comfort zone. As a psychologist at the University at Buffalo, Siri was always fascinated by the common cliché, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Little quips like that always seem to have a nugget of truth to them. But the data didn't back the saying. The existing literature suggested that there was this clear, straightforward relationship where when a bad, stressful thing happens to you, it's always bad, and you're always dealing with adversity and negative consequences. And those events have some lingering damage. So this puts you at a greater risk of psychological and even physical health problems down the road, said Siri. And it was just a very depressing picture. But one day Siri came upon some research on a concept called toughening. He explained, it was this theoretical idea that being completely overwhelmed by negative, stressful things wasn't good. But it also theorized being totally sheltered shouldn't be optimal either. There should be some amount of stress that gives you optimum psychological and physical well-being. Siri found the toughening theory played out in animals. There was, for example, a study where scientists at Stanford stressed young squirrel monkeys. They removed them from their families once a week for 10 weeks. When these monkeys grew up they were significantly more resilient and capable in the real world compared to their sheltered siblings. They were the leaders, the doers. Siri wondered does the toughening phenomenon apply to humans? Siri and his research team began a study. They asked people about the big stressors they'd faced in life. It was a perfectly ordinary group. There were 2,500 people who represented the broad spectrum of America. They were as young as 18 and as old as 101. They were half male and half female. They had the same racial makeup of the country. Some were rich while others were poor. This group was America. The people regularly took online surveys in exchange for free internet access. The surveys asked the people how many times they'd experienced stressors like a serious illness or financial difficulty, death of a loved one, violence, floods, earthquakes, and so on. It also asked them about their health and well-being. Are you depressed or anxious? Are you sick or in pain? How often do you have to go to the doctor? And how many prescription pills do you take? Are you happy? What Siri found imploded the existing literature and confirmed his notion. Compared to the people who'd been sheltered their entire lives, the people who'd faced some adversity reported better psychological well-being over the several years of the study, said Siri. They had higher life satisfaction and fewer psychological and physical symptoms. They were less likely to use prescription painkillers. They used healthcare services less. They were less likely to report their employment status as disabled. By facing some challenge, but not an overwhelming amount, these people developed an internal capacity that left them more robust and resilient. They were better able to deal with new stresses they hadn't faced before, said Siri. Siri knew he was onto something big, but he wondered whether he'd see similar results in a controlled environment. He brought a group of people into the lab and asked them how many trying events they'd had in their lives. He then had them stick their hand in a bucket of ice water and leave it there for as long as they could. The same relationship comes out, said Siri. People report that the pain feels less intense if they have a history of some lifetime adversity. Not a high level, but, critically, not zero. Their mind is also less likely to go to a bad place during the experience. They also have fewer negative thoughts during and after the experience. He's since done this with all kinds of stress-inducing tasks. He's put people through exams, had them give speeches in front of a big group, etc. His findings are consistent. People who've gone through some adversity show a more positive response, he said.
they feel like the event is an exciting opportunity rather than a sense of overwhelming threat. Based on findings like series, there's a small but growing body of research that suggests people see the same effect by engineering big challenges. This new research looks at taking on epic outdoor tasks as a way to find the physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual tools that Elliot wants to impart. Take what teams of scientists based in New Zealand and the UK found. They combed through nearly 100 studies on the psychological impact of outdoor challenges. Their takeaway, leaving the modern sterile world and exposing ourselves to new stressors can help us develop the toughness that Siri is so passionate about. Confronting risk, fear, or danger produces optimal stress and discomfort, which in turn promotes outcomes such as improved self-esteem, character building, and psychological resilience, they wrote. The desire in some of us to get out and test ourselves one researcher believes is a sign of the times in which people are looking for a new way to escape from an increasingly regulated and sanitized way of living. And something like a misogi might stoke something deep inside, because they incite stresses similar to the ones that men and women dealt with before all this comfort came at us, the researchers theorized. This is why the scientists also believe that an outdoor test like a backcountry hunt or summiting a mountain can be better than more contrived challenges, like organized urban marathons or team sports. I spoke about this with Douglas Fields, one of the country's leading neuroscientists. He's a senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health NIH who runs their Department of Neurocytology, which is the study of neurons. He told me that when you undergo a new, stressful experience like misogi, you're transferring short-term memories into long-term memories, what just happened to you, and what it led to, and what you should do next time you face a similar situation. In general, this is because memory is about the future, said Fields. We retain experiences that may be of survival value at another time. I asked Siri specifically about Misogi and mentioned the reports of Elliot, Parrish and Corver. That dovetails really nicely with how I think this stuff is working, said Siri. There should be a common psychological process that leads to these benefits. If I develop fitness by swimming, I'm still going to be fit when I run, he continued. I may not be a top form runner, but the cardiovascular endurance will be there. Likewise with this toughening process. It should give me this internal capacity that leaves me better able to deal with many things. Skip notes. This also explains why humans have undersized fears of some of the modern ways we die. Like car accidents. 5070. OR 90. Elliot is like a Misogi televangelist. He incited my interest in finding my own wild terrifying long shot task. I wanted a Misogi of my own. And so when Donnie called me with a proposition to do some serious edge surfing, I was ready to jump. I'm going to Alaska for a month or so, he said. It's going to be a massive, massive adventure. We'll go deep into the Arctic hunting caribou. When we fly in there, you're going to think, this can't be real. The land is wild and untouched for as far as you can see. The tundra is just so, so big. We'll time the trip to the Great Caribou Migration. Thousands of caribou will be moving south, and it will be one of the most amazing things you'll ever see. There are grizzlies everywhere. Wolves, too. We'll climb ancient mountains and cross glacial rivers. We'll face violent storms. The Arctic is one of the most extreme places on Earth. And we'll be utterly alone out there. If weather hits we could get stranded for days days? I asked. Oh, yeah. Days. He trailed off, then came back. I want this to be a sincere, sincere adventure. We're going to see stuff every single day that will absolutely blow your mind. But we're going to have to be all in. Okay, I told him. I'm all in. We hung up and euphoria set in. For about two minutes. I was then also blanketed with the realization that I was hazardously underprepared. Our Nevada trip was uncomfortable and while on it, I longed deeply for the antiseptic comfort and safety of my modern life. But it was still well within the 50 50th range of me being able to complete it. This trip. Astoundingly more uncomfortable and risky. 
I understood how Elliot must have felt standing atop the Grand Canyon's south rim, looking over the 8,000-foot-deep gash in the ground separating him from the north rim. Adventure and apprehension. Because another part of that same conversation with Donnie went like this. You realize this is going to be a lot more extreme and dangerous than the Nevada trip, right? Donnie said. Yeah, I figured, I replied. How much more extreme and dangerous? Twenty times. Oh, I can handle that. I was afraid you were going to say fifty. Well, it might be fifty. Could be seventy. Or ninety, said Donnie. Ninety? Jesus. Sure. I'm an Eagle Scout. But the concepts of surviving killer weather, angry wildlife and treacherous terrain, constructing emergency fires, lean taws and tourniquets and tying the proper knot for every knot tying scenario were deleted from my mind sometime in college after I discovered Evan Williams' discount bourbon. Knots. I still tie my shoes bunny ear style, the backup method for when you're six year old isn't quite cognitively advanced enough for loop swoop and pull. In a perfectly designed misogi, you give it everything you have, and you just finish it. Or maybe you just barely fail, Elliot told me. To finish it with a lot left is not really doing it right. You want to explore what your potential is out on the edges. And so it was that six months before the bush plane was set to take off from that cold coats of view runway, I began an attempt to rewild myself. With some preparation, I thought, I could take the odds that I make it through the entire trip from a long shot to a coin flip. I recall the conversation Donnie and I had in Nevada. Let's say you wanted to start hunting tomorrow, he said as we were hiking to the peak of Cleve Creek Baldy, a roughly 11,000 foot vantage point where we plan to glass for elk. It's all about preparing for a specific animal in a specific place at a specific time. Sure. He explained, you have to know how to draw a bow or fire a rifle. But you also need to learn the local hunting regulations, weather and land patterns, and everything about the animal's biology. How it leverages its strongest senses travels across the land and behaves under stress. Its sleep cycles, diet and drives. You'll also have to build out the right gear system and calculate your food needs, said Donnie. The final step is the hunt, which won't be a walk in the woods. Even seasoned hunters have about a 25% success rate, he tells me. Think of how you'd move through the forest and behave if you knew a human was hunting you. That's how most big game have evolved to behave all day. I needed to go from a desk-bound writer to a modern mountain man. And I had just a handful of months to cram for the exam. I recalled the second rule of Misogi and decided that a logical first principle should be to make it back alive. Which is how I found myself in the visitor center of a nearby state park, sitting through an emergency wilderness medicine course. The two-day seminar promised to teach me the wilderness medicine skills I'd need to recreate with confidence in the backcountry. It pitched itself as ideal for individuals in remote locations. I'd learn how to deal with many of the horrors that could end up killing me. A broken spine or bashed in skull plane crash. Compound fractures and cavernous puncture wounds, cliff falls gores. Hypothermia, lightning strikes, pulmonary edema Alaskan weather and landscape. Etc. The course was filled mostly with outdoor adventure guides, scoutmasters, camp counselors, and government wildlife biologists. For insurance purposes these people needed a stamp certificate confirming they'd taken the course. There were also a couple of retirees, who arrived dressed as if the course were a stopover between the Hemingway Safari and the summit of Mount Everest. These gentlemen were wearing $1,300 worth of high-tech travel pants, shirts and hats, oversized waterproof boots and backpacks the size of a 12-year-old that were fully loaded with Lord knows what. And I couldn't quite understand why these guys were taking the course. They made it clear that they knew everything about the wilderness and survival in it, a point they expressed by telling old-timey hearsay tales of outdoor horrors. I suffered two days of the instructors and retirees preparing me for so many ways I could die or injure myself in the backcountry. But my biggest fear still hadn't been addressed. After the course, I approached one of the instructors, a minuscule grinning, Minnesota summer camp counselor looking type. 
What do we do in the event that a grizzly bear attacks? I asked. He gave me a disappointed sounding response. Yeah, we don't cover animal attacks in this course. There are just so many different animals that can attack you out there. Then he pepped up. But you do now know how to dress gaping wounds. So if the bear were to attack, you could use what you learned here to stop the bleeding. As he reviewed wound dressing, my mind drifted to a story my high school geometry teacher told me. The guy spent summers working on a fishing boat in Alaska, and he'd reward us with bear stories if we all turned in our homework. This particularly gruesome tale involved a young deckhand on a charter boat. The kid had spotted a massive blueberry bush on the shoreline and had gone to it to pick berries for guests. As the kid plucked, the boat's guests watched. Then they noticed activity on the bush's other side. A half-ton grizzly also thought blueberries from this particular bush seemed like a refreshing treat. The two obliviously circled the bush. The tourists yelled at the kid. Their cries were swallowed by the wind and the river. The bear and the kid picked on obliviously converging. Until they met. The kid went saucer-eyed. The grizzly reared up on his hind legs, pulled back his massive paw and slapped the kid's head clean off. Like a little leaguer hitting a baseball off a tee. Slapped off the kid's head. But, hey, I knew how to dress a puncture wound. I got home and searched what to do if a grizzly attacks and landed on a page from the U.S. National Park Service. Should a 1,000-pound grizzly decide to pick a fight with 170-pound me, the U.S. government suggests, I leave my pack on, fall face down to the ground, play dead, and cover my neck with my hands. This technique, I assume, stalls the inevitable decapitation. And while I'm down there, I might want to spread my legs. This gives the bear a trickier time flipping me over so that he can then dig his four-inch claws directly into my soul. Bears typically attack humans because we've inadvertently stumbled too close to their cubs, food or territory. In which case, the bear usually stops short of killing and lets the person off with a mauling. But all bets are off if the bear comes into my tent at night. That's the sign of a creature who craves human flesh. In that event, I'm to go full on Sugar Ray Robinson, throwing haymakers jabs and uppercuts into the bear's face. This technique is useful, I was left to assume, because it injures your hands. The coroner then has enough evidence to confidently tell your family, he went down with a fight. Assuming they recover the body. But enough of the bear, and what he's eating. I had to eat up there too. Our crew wouldn't be surviving on hunted meat. It could take weeks to find an animal, if we find one at all Donnie explained. We'll pack everything in. Problem is, every ounce of food, clothing, and other gear in my pack would be more weight on my back. I didn't want to be walking out of the woods with leftovers, because they'd have weighed me down the entire trip. But I also had no intention of running out of food. This was a hunt and not a hunger strike. Various calculators estimated I'd burn roughly 5,000 to 8,000 calories a day out there, which seemed like a lot of food to carry. Donnie explained that I'd be better off packing a livable amount of calories. Say, 1,800 to 2,500 a day. Extra energy could come from some of the excess weight on my body. Oh, we'll be hungry, Donnie told me. But we'll survive. I usually lose 15 pounds every time I do a month-long hunt. For breakfast and lunch Donnie eats energy bars and calorie-dense items like nuts and dried fruit. No preparation needed. For dinner it's those freeze-dried backpacking meals that come in a pouch. Boiling water is poured directly into the pouch to cook the meal sort of like instant ramen cups. These meals have a 30-year shelf life way as much as a few Q-tips and taste similar. I didn't love the food on the last trip with Donnie, but I understood the logic. So I'd also pack energy bars and freeze-dried backpacking meals. Maybe some trail mix too. And okay, a few candy bars. It was going to be a bland month, heavy on the preservatives and sugar. Priority number two, don't embarrass myself. I could surely apply the fake it till you make it, rule. I didn't want to hold back the group or have them hear a single complaint from me. 
Unless my issue would somehow put us all in danger and break Misogi rule number two. For example, I'm cold. Nope. I'm cold because I'm rather sure I have frostbite on my left foot, and if the numbness spreads any higher up my leg you're probably going to have to carry me out of here. Reasonable. I feel tired. No. I feel tired, and I think it's because I picked up hantavirus a few miles back. I'm afraid that just by looking at me you're going to catch this killer too. Valid. It was abundantly clear that I'd be cold, wet, and tired for most of the trip. Cold is a function of movement and layers. I'd be moving a lot, raising my temperature, and I'd happily carry extra layers to avoid frostbite and constant teeth chattering. But I couldn't pack just any clothes. In fact, Donnie says an easy way to die in the wild is packing the wrong gear. First off, cotton will kill you. When wet, Cotton becomes cold and hypothermia sets in before you can say I'm CC cold. Dot Dio, you think we're in TT trouble? Wool and synthetics stay warm when wet, so you definitely want those for base layers, Donnie said. Then you maybe want a wool sweater and socks. Definitely down pants and a down jacket with a hood. Also gloves and a hat. Then you want waterproof outer layers. We're going to wear the same shit every day. Bring an extra base layer and socks in case those get wet. Otherwise, just one of everything. For boots, Donnie put me in touch with a century-old German boot manufacturer called Hanway. I checked the options on their website and found some designed for winter mountaineering excursions. One pair was rated warm down to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The price was nearly $400. When I brought this up with my wife, she replied well, how much would you pay to keep your toes? More than $400. So the boots went into the cart. I could and did buy my way into good gear and light food. But the one thing I couldn't sidestep with a credit card was being physically prepared. I would be repeatedly ascending and descending thousands of exposed vertical feet in search of an animal that I might have to eventually carry out in 100-pound sections. I had to rewild my workouts. My typical workouts, like those of most modern people, are basically to avoid drawing negative attention at the pool. Form over function. But for this trip, I'd require the skills humans had needed for millions of years in order to survive. The ability to climb steep mountain faces. Swiftly move in on an animal or escape a dangerous situation. Jump across a creek. Resist falls and rough ground. Persist while carrying heavy loads across long distances. I emailed Dr. Doug Kekajian, an old friend who served in USAF Pararescue in the Special Forces branch of the Air Force. When Navy SEALs or Army Rangers got injured in the field, Doug parachuted in to rescue them. He carried out missions in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Horn of Africa, and one year was named an outstanding airman, which basically meant he was an MVP for the Air Force. When he was not saving lives in Fallujah, Doug was at Columbia University studying for a doctorate in physical therapy. Picture Captain America. Now at 40 IQ points. Doug now helps U.S. Special Forces soldiers and pros in every major sports league find the sweet spot where they can redline on a mission or in a game and avoid injury. He graciously agreed to lend his sporting wisdom to me, a gangly writer who considers his greatest athletic achievement to be holding the high score on various Papa Shot arcade basketball games throughout the Las Vegas metro area. We need to turn you into a very physically versatile human being, he said. To do that I do two weekly days of targeted strength training using kettlebells, barbells, and body weight. Think movement patterns that the body was designed to do like squatting, jumping lunging, doing pull-ups, carrying, etc. Then I did a weekly day each of sprinting walking uphill while wearing a 50-pound backpack and hiking anywhere from 5 to 15 miles. I'd also start every workout with some drills to bulletproof the joints that are commonly injured out in the field. Ankles, knees, shoulders, etc. Roll an ankle out there, and it's a long hobble back to civilization. Unless the wolves find you early on. This brought me closer to Misogi rule number one, that 50 50ths shot at making it to the other side. Finding discomfort in Las Vegas was easy. 
All I had to do was walk into the desert. Hiking and running in the summer felt like exercising in a furnace. But these hikes and runs were also an oasis away from my daily life in the built environment. I toss on my gargantuan $400 boots, they needed breaking in after all, and trudge through Red Rock Canyon's Black Rock Desert, Joshua Tree Forests, or Piney Highlands for a few hours each weekend. These natural environments acted like a pressure washer on my mind, clearing out the week's grime. Who needs to chat up a $100 slash our therapist when there are long, quiet, empty trails waiting to be walked? And my exercise in the heat delivered effects, I couldn't get doing biceps curls and treadmill work as I watched Dog the Bounty Hunter down at some climate-controlled mega-gym. According to scientists at the University of Oregon, people who exercised in a 100-degree room for 10 days, for example, increased their fitness performance markers significantly more than a group who did the exact same workout in an air-conditioned room. The hot exercise caused inexplicable changes to the heart's left ventricle. This can improve the heart's health and efficiency. Hot exercise also activates heat shock proteins and BDNF. The former are inflammation fighters linked to living longer, while the latter is a chemical that promotes the survival and growth of neurons. BDNF might be protective against depression and Alzheimer's, according to the NIH. I wasn't afraid to get a little creative. To get used to carrying heavy stuff all day, I'd throw on a 40 to 60 pound pack as I did chores around the house. Imagine a grown man vacuuming folding laundry and scrubbing toilets, all while loaded down like an infantry grunt. Or I'd toss on the pack and walk my dogs in my desert neighborhood while wearing my winter boots. I looked like a righteous asshole. Felt like one too. But I'd rather look and feel like one in a Las Vegas subdivision than perform like one once I got to the Arctic. Carrying weight over distance, I found was a two-for-one that profoundly improved both my strength and endurance. At night, I read books and obscure old government reports about the environment where I was headed. Like Jack O'Connor's The Big Game Animals of North America, a book Donnie considers his Bible. Or a Sand County Almanac, Elda Leopold's opus on conservation science policy and ethics. Or scientific studies about the western Arctic caribou herd we'd be hunting. It was nice to experience the land and its challenges through the eyes of people who had gone and come back. Many of them also riding nerds like me. The preparation process quickly reaffirmed my notion that I suck at new things. Wilderness savant, I am not. Trying to adopt survival skills, calculate calorie and gear requirements, move through all of the workouts, and understand complex ecological systems was a humbling and certainly bumbling experience. There were workouts where I wanted to quit frustrations as I tried to understand things I didn't and serious dread that I was going to flub this whole thing and have the most miserable month of my life. If I even managed to make it that long. Yet along the way I took comfort in the fact that I am not alone. We all suck at new things. But clumsily exiting our comfort zones offers way too many upsides to ignore. Learning new skills, particularly the ones humans needed for millions of years that require us to use our mind and body, would stay with me beyond Alaska in a very zen, the path is the goal type of way. There was all the new expertise I was picking up. But learning new skills is also one of the best ways to enhance awareness of the present moment, with no burning incense, Buddhist mantras, or meditation apps involved. I needed to only consider what I was doing before I started prepping for Alaska. I'd basically eaten the same meals driven the same route to work, had the same conversations with coworkers, and come home to watch the same television for more than half a decade. Scientists in the United Kingdom recently found that our brain has a trance-like autopilot, or sleepwalking mode. Once we've done something over and over, our mind zones out of whatever old thing it's doing. Instead of being present and aware, we're far more likely to be lost somewhere inside our noggin. We're planning what we'll eat for dinner, wondering when the new season of that one show comes out speculating about our office for Nemi's salary. We live in a state of constant mental churn and meaningless chatter. My months of preparation changed much of that. New situations kill the mental clutter. In newness we're forced into presence and focus. This is because we can't anticipate what to expect and how to respond, 
breaking the trance that leads to life in fast forward. Newness can even slow down our sense of time. This explains why time seemed slower when we were kids. Everything was new then, and we were constantly learning. Psychologist William James wrote about this in his 1890 work, The Principles of Psychology. The same space of time seems shorter as we grow older. In youth we may have an absolutely new experience, subjective or objective, every hour of the day. Apprehension is vivid, retentiveness strong, and our recollections of that time like those of a time spent in rapid and interesting travel are of something intricate, multitudinous, and long drawn out. But as each passing year converts some of this experience into automatic routine that we hardly note at all, the days and the weeks smooth themselves out in recollection to contentless units, and the years grow hollow and collapse. A team of scientists in Israel confirmed James's notion in a series of six studies. They surveyed groups of people doing things that were either new or old to them. In all studies, the scientists wrote we found that people remember duration as being shorter on a routine activity than on a non-routine activity. This slowing down of time is something Parrish told me happens in Misogi. I become incredibly focused on the task at hand, he said. When I look back on a misogi that was a few hours it will seem like days, because I remember every detail. Additionally, stepping outside our comfort zone to learn useful skills that require both mind and body alters our brain's wiring on a deep level. This can increase our productivity and resilience against some diseases. Learning improves myelination, a process that essentially gives our nervous system a V8 engine creating stronger, more efficient nerve signals throughout our brain and body. Brains with more myelin are linked to improved performance across the board. Having too little of this stuff is connected to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Researchers at the University of Michigan, for example, found that dementia significantly dropped in people who dedicated more of their lives to learning. The fascinating part about that study was that dementia went down in the learners even though their rate of diabetes, a condition that increases the odds of developing dementia, went up which basically suggests that dedicating ourselves to learning new things could help offset some of our poor habits. The day before I left, I was packing my refrigerator size backpack. Wool layers, rain gear, boots, energy bars, freeze-dried meals, the works. I ran through a quick mental and physical checklist. I hadn't re-earned all my old Boy Scout badges, but I had pulled myself closer to the first and second rules of Misogi. I was leaner and stronger, Ironically, the leaner part would actually hurt me once I began burning a massive amount of calories on the hunt. I could toss a 50-pound pack on my back and go pretty much until the authorities called me off. I'd also acquired a new library of natural knowledge and found myself saying things to my wife like can you believe grizzly bears love moths? They'll eat 40,000 of them in a single day. Or did you know that if you nick an artery you can bleed out in just 5 minutes? I heaved the pack into the trunk of my wife's car. Then I headed to sleep in my warm, overstuffed bed for the very last time. She drove me to the airport early that morning, leaving me with a hug and a suggestion. Don't get your head slapped off by a grizzly bear.